Racism in all of its forms is evil. It's an infestation here in the US that has taken many forms since the founding of this country, from slavery in our past to anti-Semitism and now racism towards white people. Over the past couple of decades, under the guise of DEI, racism towards white people has been intensifying. Part of what guides people who believe in this ideology is the belief that racism, well, it only counts if it's against non-white nationalities. The reason for this excuse given by the anti-white racists is because, well, white people are systemically in power, and only those in power can really wield true racism. Now, the argument, of course, is stupid, as are those who try and use the excuse. But I digress. This growing discrimination reached critical mass, leading to the general public learning of this evil. This has finally caused the pendulum to begin swinging in the other direction, as more and more individuals are rejecting this evil ideology. This has led to a backlash that is only intensified with time, which then leads us to our story today. This story is taken from the New York Post, and it reads New York City to pay $2.1 million in race discrimination settlement with three educators. Toxic whiteness. The article writes that the city will pay a total of $2.1 million to three white Department of Education executives demoted under ex-school Chancellor Richard Carranza and replaced by less qualified people of color. This according to the charge. Lois Herrera, Jay Murray, and Laura Fehu will receive $700,000 each. This according to the settlement reached. After the judge ruled that they offer evidence of race-based discrimination in Carranza's DOE, paving the way for a June trial. The lawyer Perry told the Post that this landmark case is a resounding affirmation that discrimination of any form should not be tolerated in educational institutions, regardless of the race of those negatively impacted. The lawsuit was filed five years ago, and the suit alleged that Carranza waged a crusade against, quote, toxic whiteness, end quote, in the city Department of Education. Herrera, who had a Harvard master's degree, was working successfully as CEO of the Office of Safety and Youth Development when one of Carranza's deputies, chancellors, abruptly stripped her title and replaced her with a, quote, less qualified black man, Mark Rampersant, who held a GED, this according to the lawsuit. The next person on the list is Murray, the then executive director of the Office of Counseling Support Programs, was told to report to Rampersant, the first in a series of demotions. She remains on the DOE payroll, but with sharply reduced duties. And then Fehu, then senior supervising superintendent who oversaw 46 DOE superintendents, was replaced by an underling, Cheryl Watson Harris, who is black and, at the time, lacked the requiring New York licensing. Now, an internal DOE email written by the DOE's then Chief Operating Officer Ursulina Ramirez said de Blasio, who appointed Carranza Chancellor in 2018, was fixated on diversity. And the article goes on to say that those picked to replace the three women got the jobs after a tap on the shoulder without the positions being advertised and other candidates interviewed which is a big no-no in the corporate world. Now, Carranza quit the top DOE job back in February of 2021, and de Blasio left office on December 31st of 2021. Now, the three women feel, quote, justified and vindicated by the result of this significant legal battle, and they hope that the light that was shed on the DOE's policies will help other institutions understand that every individual deserves to be treated with dignity and fairness. And of course, the city has said, we haven't done any wrong doing. Now, my friends, this is a growing trend that has been taking place across the United States. Diversity, equity, and inclusivity initiatives have come under legal scrutiny, with an ever-increasing number of lawsuits alleging that these policies result in so-called reverse discrimination, which, by the way, is just discrimination. The term reverse discrimination is being used to make it sound not as bad as real discrimination. It's just reverse discrimination. Honestly, I find the, the, uh, the term maddening and insulting. Anyway, these lawsuits often allege that DEI policies and practices constitute reverse discrimination, particularly against white individuals and males under the guise of promoting diversity and inclusivity. A notable example of this would be legal challenges involving the Walt Disney Company, which has faced multiple lawsuits alleging discrimination as a result of its DEI efforts. Now, we've covered this in a previous episode, but... The Walt Disney Company has been targeted by America First Legal Foundation, which is a conservative legal nonprofit organization, which has filed a civil rights complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC, back in February of this year. This complaint was based on internal Disney documents about DEI targets that were shared on social media by Elon Musk. 
America First Legal claims that Disney's policy is illegal as hiring purely on the basis of race, sex, religion, or citizenship violates the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Now, the infection of this racist DEI ideology has infected corporate America across the board. In fact, it's even reached the gaming world, and ironically has led to backlash from gamers who have begun waking up to the fact that the tentacles of racism have begun infesting their beloved gaming franchises, all under the guise of diversity. An example of this, a shining example of this, would be Sweet Baby Inc. and co the controversies that surround this company. They are a narrative development and consultation studio which focuses on so-called enhancing diversity in video games through narrative consultation, aiming to create more inclusive and representative game content, which is just a dog whistle and code wording for anti-white, anti-straight content. Now, Sweet Baby Inc. managed to latch on to many AAA gaming studios, and they did this in every way possible, including threatening companies that if they didn't want to hire them or do what they wanted after they were hired, they would use social media to attack them. Check this madness out. Put this stuff up to your higher-ups, and if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's gonna happen if they don't give you what you want. Because they have to consider, like, I, I say that all out as a joke, but it's actually very, very true because if you start to consider the people who are player and audience facing and who have to deal with mitigating harm and with keeping the sentiment around their game and their project positive, there's like a genuine value that you can impress upon them with um, both ethically and financially. Now, Sweet Baby Inc. has been accused by gamers and commentators of pushing an anti-white narrative within the games it consults on, including whenever possible to remove white characters from their games. They do this in part by pushing an agenda that prioritizes diversity over other aspects of game development. And critics argue that this leads to forced diversity, where the inclusion of diverse characters and storylines feels inauthentic or tokenistic, meaning they don't fit at all, but they just put them in there because reasons. Now let's shift back to the corporate world at large here in the US. In response to these legal lawsuits, many companies have now begun to alter their DEI policies. They know that inevitably the long reach of the law will eventually come for them as well. They're seeing what's happening to Disney. They saw what happened to Starbucks. They see what's happening to the backlash with, with Sweet Baby Inc. and so many others. And so now there is genuine concern that their racist practices may finally come back to bite them. For example, after facing threats of lawsuits, companies like Yum Brands and America Airlines removed specific racial targets from their executive compensation plans, which honestly is a bare minimum move, but at least it's a small step in the right direction. Now, as these cases progress through the legal system, they will likely influence the development of DEI policies going forward. Companies will have to choose whether to practice their blatant racism in the name of DEI or protect themselves and stick to the old, good old-fashioned practice of non-discrimination. Which doesn't seem like that should be a difficult choice, but here we are nonetheless. We are at a pivotal moment, my friends, in American history. We're going to get to decide if we allow racism to flourish once again in our country through these racist ideologies, like practices of DEI, or we can choose to stick to the progress that we've made over the past 60 years since the, since the uh, passage of the Civil Rights Act. What we do with all of this, well, time, of course, will tell. And that, my friends, will bring this episode to a close once more. From the To Be Frank Show, I am Adrian. Thanks for watching, my friends. I'll see you all next time.